Good evening, everyone. I am Gwydion Sullivan, Penn Faulkner's Executive Director, and I'm so grateful we all get to be together tonight, even virtually. We are living through such heavy times, and I don't know about you, but one of my greatest comforts is the richness and the deafness and the nuance and the power of fiction, which is what brings us together. So thank you very much for being here, all of you. Now, most of you probably already know Penn Faulkner, but in case some of you don't, we are a national literary organization that's best known for giving out the Penn Faulkner Award for fiction and the Penn Malamud Award for excellence in the short story. But we also run a variety of education programs that bring visiting authors and donated books and writing instruction into underserved classrooms in DC, all at no cost to the schools and students in order to inspire the next generation of readers and writers. And uh, of course, we also hold public literary programs just like this one. Our literary conversations are all about dialogue. And the last few minutes of tonight's event are for your questions. So please use the Q&A box at any time during the conversation you're about to hear if you want to join in on that dialogue. Now, tonight we are very, very lucky to be joined by three people who tell stories about a part of our world that's become kind of a hotbed of passion and courage and conflict of late, the college campus and really any, any campus. First, we have Sochil Gonzalez, a Penn Faulkner board member, a former Penn Faulkner Award judge, and the New York Times bestselling author of Olga Dies Dreaming, whose new novel, Anita De Monte Laughs Last, was a Reese's Book Club pick. We have Sonora Ja, the author of three books, the latest of which is the novel The Laughter, which won the 2024 Washington Book Award for Fiction and was named a Best Book of 2023 by The New Yorker and NPR. And then we have Rebecca Mackay, another former Penn Faulkner Award judge. We got two tonight. She is the author of New York Times bestseller, I Have Some Questions for You, and her last novel, The Great Believers, was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. And finally, to my absolute joy, our moderator tonight is Lupita Aquino, who might be better known as Lupita Reads on Instagram and TikTok and threads. She is the world's most passionate advocate for books and a noted book critic as well. So thank you, Lupita. Take it away. Hi, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I want to welcome our esteemed authors to uh, turn on their cameras and join us. Um, I don't know about you all or where y'all joining us from, but I was just letting them know when we were in the green room in the back that it's been a while since I've done a virtual event. Um, so thank you just for joining us uh, virtually. I know that uh, for a while we did this in virtual thing and then you know, we all got back in person and some of us didn't do it as much anymore. So thank you for spending your evening with us um, uh, talking about these fabulous books and uh, the theme of the campus novel, which I think is perfect for the season, like October. It lends itself to that, is it not? <laughs> um, so I just kind of want to kick us off with a general question. You know, as a reader, I think a lot about... Um, just kind of wondering, where did the author start? Where, where did this start with the author? You know, um, was it, were, you didn't set out to maybe sit down and say, I'm going to write a campus novel, right? So I'm curious, like, it's kind of like a chicken and an egg question. Like, did the campus novel idea come first? Was it a character? Was it both? What was that initial spark, that idea, that motivation? And we can start with uh, Sochi. Oh, sure. Um, thanks. <laughs> um, I... I think honestly, what happened was I was actually trying to make the television adaptation of my first book, and I was getting such stupid notes um, about Latino culture and like how it should look and how it should be. And I found myself frustrated and thinking about how, why is this so hard? Because then I was like, because we don't have any sense of each other's aesthetic understanding. And then I thought about like, when did this start? And I was like, well, if you think about it, you didn't see a single 
Latino person in all, oh. art, and you saw one black person in all of your four years of taking an obsessive amount of art history, which I did when I was in college. And so I had this, and then I thought about the artist that I first discovered that kind of literally led me to like, have like a moment where you're just like, there's Latino art. And it was when I got, was gifted a book of, of about Caribbean art. And I, you know, and then I found the story of Ana Mendieta and, and like, and so I just sort of immediately kind of had this idea of weaving. I thought about how would life have been different had I discovered her sooner and like within the context of my academic work. And so then that led me to sort of have this thought about these, this kind of woven story, which is what the novel is, but it was really about what we what we lose as individuals when we are erased and forgotten and how much we get shaped in these institutions. And, and then it ended up kind of being kind of a fun way, you know, I think we all sort of touch about on this about like being like, not the person that's meant to be in the campus theoretically, oh. right? And like, and that, that kind of just led to a whole other thing. But that, yeah, you're right. It wasn't like, I was like, you know what I should do? It was a campus novel, but like it was, it was kind of, funny. and then the limitations of my imagination is that I only could think about my own campus where I went to school. Mm. So I just finally was like, just stop pretending that it's a different place and just embrace it. <laughs> Love um, how about you, Sonora? Uh, yes, yeah, similar to Shochil, I didn't start, uh, start out writing a campus novel. Um, I was writing a uh, a novel actually speaking of the season it was in uh, at the end of October and the beginning of November in 2016 and I was writing uh, the story about Islamophobia and I was interviewing French Muslims in uh, in France and then the Trump got elected and mm -hmm. so there was all this stuff about you know the Muslim ban and so there was that story that I already had that I was working on and then the voice happened oh. because that voice was sort of in the air a bit too much in the air and the and the the dread you know the dread that I oh. sort of attempted to put into my novel was there and so that 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 voice uh started to lend itself to it sort of got connected with certain voices I hear around me in my job as an academic. <laughs> and so I went with it and I thought, okay, what if this guy were a professor? And then mm -hmm. it just landed and and that voice just took over. And so so he was going to be a professor who, uh, you know, who who is telling us the story. And so then it had to be a campus novel. And then so similar to Shochil, I started to really enjoy some aspects of that story and, um, and then really leaned into it really hard. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to let you know, the voice, Ollie, of the character um, that narrates your book is still stuck in my head. <laughs> which, <Sorry>. like, <laughs> which is like, I, I don't know. I love it and I hate it. And we'll talk about that more. Um, how about you, Rebecca? Yeah, um, mine is different in a couple of ways. One of which is that my book is about a boarding school. Um, so different kind of campus yeah. and then different in that I did intend to write a campus novel. Mm. I, um, so I'll try to make this long story as quick as possible, but okay. When we I was time. a teenager, well, I mean, it could be 20 <laughs> minutes. We're not going to do that. Um, when I was a teenager, I was a scholarship day student at a boarding school near Chicago. Oh. And, you know, it was, I had a terrible time. I had a good time. It was high school, you know, the way things go. Um, a few years after college, I met my husband, who was a high school English teacher on the East Coast. I dragged him back to Chicago, and the place he got the job teaching was my old school. Mm -hmm. So we have lived now on the campus of my high school for 23 years. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit unusual. I don't teach there. I just live there. My daughter's, no, my oldest daughter's a student. Um, but it's a world I know really, really well. Mm -hmm. And boarding schools in particular get really misrepresented in pop culture, whether it's mm -hmm. books or movies, there's this like romanticization. Um, everyone's always wearing sweater vests. And also <laughs> um, really just a, a misrepresentation of the kind of students who go there in the modern era. Um, it In books, in movies, it's always very wealthy, white kids whose grandparents went there too. A responsible modern boarding school is, looks more like a small liberal arts college where they're mm -hmm. getting all kinds of students and, um, it, it's very, very different from what you see. So there was a little bit of like, I want to set the record straight. I know oh. this world so well. Um, I still didn't have a plot. And my plot came in um, as I 
got really fascinated with our cultural obsession with true crime. Mm. True crime is always about looking back and trying to figure out what already happened here. And the novel, the boarding school novel I wanted to write because I don't write YA was always going to be about an adult looking back on her time and kind of mm. re-examining what had happened. Um, so those th two things that turned out fit together. And what I have is a book about a woman who returns in her 40s to the campus of her boarding school um, to teach a class, but starts to realize that probably the wrong person is in prison for the murder of one of her classmates. And we go from there. And that's like a perfect segue into you reading a little section from us, because you know, I think that I personally love when authors read and everybody will get to read, but that's a great segue into right, the section that you picked. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the two things I need to tell you here, um, my character Bodhi has returned to this campus. It's the dead of winter. The school is called Granby. It's a totally made up school it's in New Hampshire and she's walking around. Not much is happening right now. She's just kind of wandering um, a little drunk late at night. Uh, but there's a reference to a shrine in here. The idea being she, like me, graduated in uh, 1995. And this was a shrine to Kurt Cobain that they made in the woods when he uh, mm -hmm. passed away. And I want to make sure that I'm not freezing. I see myself freezing on the screen. Is everything okay with how you can hear me? I can hear you okay. You are okay. a little... You are sometimes you're freezing, but you still come in clearly. Okay, that sounds good. I might. Um, what I'm going to do is stop blurring my background. But to do that, I have to tell people that I am in a hotel room, um, so you're going to see a bed. So we'll do that, and hopefully <laughs> that'll fix the video. Okay. Um, the lights of the old chapel tower illuminated long geometric patches of snow on the quad, the opposite of shadows. They were so beautiful that I avoided stepping on them. The tequila maybe helped my appreciation. I didn't recall being this enchanted by the snow as a student, but then my primary memory of winter here was of being cold, so cold. When I'd seen the catalog, I thought all the photos of the ski team and snowshoeing students were for effect. I hadn't understood somewhere could be so much colder than Southern Indiana for so much longer. I didn't understand how the skiers, both the athletes and the kids who'd just grown up taking ski vacations, held social dominion over the school, as if this additional form of locomotion made them a superior species. I hadn't understood how thin my socks were, how inadequate my hand-me-down coats. I passed Couchman, which I remembered as the grimmest, grungiest dorm, but it must have gotten a recent facelift. The stones looked shockingly clean in the floodlights, the fire escape new and sleek. Early freshman year, I used to sit on the lip of the old rusty one to get afternoon sun and study in peace. Maybe it was odd to perch on an appendage of a boy's dorm, but it seemed logical at the time. This was where, late that fall, Dorian Culler shouted down from his window, asked if I was there to stalk him. He thought it was so funny that it became the theme of all our interactions the next three and a half years. In front of his friends, he'd say things like, Bodhi, I got your letter, but it was weird. Guys, she wrote me this 10-page letter about how she wants my man meat. Her phrase, not mine. Bodhi, you need to get it together. Needless to say, I'd never done anything to Dorian other than get involuntarily paired with him a few times in French class. Or he'd say, Bodhi, it was not cool of you to follow my family to London. I'm in my hotel bed and I hear this moaning from underneath and everything smells like tuna fish and I look under the bed and there's Bodhi pleasuring herself. It was the kind of joke that left no room for response. I could never figure out if he thought he was flirting or if I was so far below him on the social scale that this was pure mockery. I tried to play along once, said feebly, yes, I did crawl in your window. It was to ask you to spring dance and I'll die if you don't say yes. But he only laughed bigger and said to his friends, see, I should report her. Jesus, Bodhi, this is textbook sexual harassment. I was halfway across South Bridge when I slipped, found myself plunging forward, knew how hard my chin would hit the ice. But then it was my elbows and forearms that hit instead. And I lay face down for a second, my brain jostled, my bones shaken. I felt oddly humiliated, even though no one had seen, only the specters of my youth. It jarred me for another reason too, a stupid one. I was supposed to have come back to Granby invulnerable. 15-year-old Bodhi might have fallen on the ice, might have been breakable or broken, 
might have drunk herself to sleep one night by the Kurt shrine and woken up half frozen, terrified she could have killed herself, wondering if this had actually been her intention. But 40-year-old Bodhi had her act together, had long been in control of her body and her mind. And here was the hard, cold ground rising up to remind me how easy it was to slip. I feel like I'm going to do a virtual clap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, when I read that scene, when I, I tell you, like, I felt in, in, like my inner self cringed because I know that time of passage to come back to a place where you are older and you mm -hmm. have all these ideas of who you are like as a separation of who you were then you know yeah. um and like my question that I was thinking about for you all and your characters and who narrates your stories you know I thought about how each character gives a per like a very different perspective to the campus culture based on who they are what role they play and you know in in your case Bodhi is a student and returns now as a professor mm -hmm. um and so I kind of want to start with Sochi and what what how did you decide who was going to narrate your book you know was it going to be Raquel always was it going to be your um you know Anita like what were the decisions that you went about well I sort of decided the first draft of the book was pretty much three quarters of it I, I got through about three quarters of it and it was all in third person and it was intensely depressing like it was like my, my best friend is my first reader always and she also went to brown we were not best friends there we met afterwards um but anyway she was like this is the most depressing book i've ever read in the world and you i, I can't put my finger on why but you've got to fix it like because no one wants to read this and um and i i think what, what the issue was is that because one of the stories is about the victim of a crime um she you couldn't stop thinking about the fact that this woman was the victim of a crime mm. and it starts the night of the crime and you couldn't stop seeing her as a victim. And then that's my 20 minute story. I will spare you, but divine intervention led me to realize that she needed to be in first person, mm. um, the victim of the crime, because now she has agency in how she sees everything and you remove the distance between you woman, you know, I always imagine my readers mainly a woman, but you woman reading in the world, knowing the cause of this death and then not being able to be like, this is terrible that she was like murdered, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then Raquel, I sort of always imagined, you know, the, a third protagonist is the, that you get POV from is the person that murdered Anita. So, yeah. um, but with Raquel and Raquel is meant to be kind of growing and Jack is meant to be kind of ungrowable. Um, you know, like I sort of always knew he was not going to have any character arc. Like he is this person and he will not be changed by anything. And he's committed to being this person. But with Raquel, I think, you know, I, I wanted a bit of distance. And I think that the afterlife is meant to be the thing that's like the immediacy of first person. And so um, it was sort of beautiful to get to like what was beautiful and then sad and why the first draft was also sad was that I had sort of decided that she and I, Raquel and I were going to have some things in common and other things that were not in common. You know, she was going to be a distinctly different personality for me. But then as I walked her through the day, we ended up having some things in common that I didn't want us to have in common. Mm. You know, like, like she has many, 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 many like food issues. She's very, very lonely. She's like, it's impossible for her to kind of really see the depth of connection that she could have around her because she's so anxious about like how to maximize this opportunity and and I, I i think um i've had a lot of really fascinating conversations with people that i knew when i was in college um rebecca and i are exactly the same age so uh, this character basically like started college like would have started college the fall that your narrator would have theoretically graduated right <laughs> Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it was really, I don't think I felt that Raquel had a ton of agency and part of the bo book's discovery was her getting that, you know, mm. like, and her kind of like coming to that, actually. And so um, it felt like a close third felt right for her. Whereas like, actually, Anita is very, very wise because she's dead. So she can see her life with a lot of perspective. <laughs> and I don't know if we're doing spoilers, but we, her perspectives are they're they're like we need them <laughs> yeah yeah like well and then it was sort of this fun thing to like 
you know, at a certain point I was like, oh, she ends up kind of being like this, she's sort of the spiritual bigger sister that mm -hmm. Raquel needs. And, and, and so she kind of, Raquel ends up discovering her, but um, Anita hovers in a much more real way at the end. And again, like, it's so funny. I didn't intend people say like, oh, like there's so much magical realism in your novel. And I was like, I just didn't think that her heaven would be the same as somebody else's heaven. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, like I don't think it was intended to be magical realism. It just like, you're like, well, now she's dead. Where does she go? <laughs> like, right? like, it's like, 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 it's like, you kind of have to just keep going with it. And, um, and so I think that, it, it sort of ended up blending in, but um, yeah, like I think for me, a lot of this was about Raquel. And actually, you know, she goes through a relationship in the book and like, and a lot of what I was also trying to sort of show is like, even when things are bad, you know, it's not a great relationship, but she gains a lot from it. Like it gives mm. her a real sense of, she gets to borrow the person that she's dating. She gets to borrow their eyes and their sense of access and belong, and like, and it, like, appropriateness of being there you know like the sense of like ease that this guy has in the world she suddenly he does manage to bestow some of that on her and i think that that is part of the character's transformation and something that i really wanted to kind of talk about which is like you know one relationship is fatally toxic but the other does she's able to extract herself and keep the good things mm, a good parallel yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um how about you rebecca in terms of Bodhi and, and and it's not just Bodhi we have multiple in both cases there you know we have the multiple POVs where we have a perspective where you know I don't want to call Bodhi unreliable because she is telling a certain truth yes. as, as well as everyone else I think you right. present these POVs that give us right. that idea that there's not a singular truth right um right and it's interesting like we say we say literally in her point of view but we get to hear from a lot of different people mm -hmm. um so there were there are two ways of thinking about it. One is uh, just, you know, how I chose her as the person to tell the story. Um, and for me, because I know there are a lot of people who start with character and then build from there. Uh -huh. I start with plot always. So I end up usually kind of reverse engineering my characters. Like, who does this person need to be? Uh -huh. um, who does this person need to be to get into this mess, um, who would be the most changed by these circumstances, who would be the most vulnerable to them, who has the skills we need for this story. Um, and early on, I actually started her out much more convinced that something was wrong with this conviction, much more empowered. Um, but then it, there wasn't room for her to change. Oh. So I had to kind of give her more runway and back her up and slowly change her. Um, and in terms of the point of view, the really weird thing about my point of view is that it's first person, but it's also second person. Mm -hmm. She is talking to this sketchy music teacher from her school in her head the whole time. Um, so when she hasn't seen in decades, but um, the kind of the, the person that you thought was fine at the time and you start looking back with fresh perspective in the Me Too era and going, oh, no, no, no. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and um, I, my idea was, you know, obviously she's not literally thinking 400 pages at him but you know certain times in your life that you um you're just narrating to someone in your head maybe it's someone you're really mad at so you're monologuing at them mm -hmm. maybe it's someone who's departed from your life so you're talking to them maybe it's just that you revisit a place where you used to know someone so you're thinking about them constantly you feel like they can see you or like you're talking to them and um that was what I wanted so there's this um, the you of the title of I have some questions for you. Ideally, when a reader sees that it kind of implicates the reader because you don't know what's going on yet. But as you get into the book, that you is a very specific person, yeah. um, which was, you know, nothing I've ever done before with point of view. It was it was fun. And you're right. I appreciate that. She's not unreliable. She is way she is extremely painstakingly honest about her own unreliability like mm -hmm. she's not going to pretend she remembers um there's no like I remember this day and then the wind was blowing from the east and he was wearing a blue sweater and he blinked right mm -hmm. I wanted it to be the way that memory actually works yeah. which is we get these little pieces but they might be wrong and then you hear someone else's story later someone else's point of view and you go oh yeah that's right that it didn't happen that way um so I think she's the most reliable narrator I've ever written because she's so honest about what she remembers or doesn't remember. But it makes us aware of the things she 
you know, can't magically do. So I appreciate that you see that she's not a reliable narrator. Thank you. Well, on, honestly, and then reading it and thinking in terms of this conversation, Sonora has a character who is Ollie, Dr. Hardin, who I, I said earlier, I hate love, you know, and <laughs> I hate love because there is so much to a truth to him in complexity and nuance and you know I, I would love for you to read um, a section for us that I know you have prepared that I think will really give voice to what I'm trying to to explain here great yeah so I'm reading from around the middle of the novel and he's he's just find, found out that he may not make tenure in the institution that he's at uh, so you have to imagine this in the voice of a white male uh, English professor, middle-aged English professor. That's not my voice. So use your imagination. And I'm not good at doing his voice. So you don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, I was a traditionalist. The cannon wars were upon us. And my career was deemed to be as dead as the dead white men on my curriculum. My syllabi were a tribute to fossils, some said. Whatever happened to academic freedom? We had made room for everyone, and now they sought to topple us over the edge. Such intolerance was hardly what we'd fought for. My scholarly agenda stood little chance before the marauding bigots who turned education into a battle cry in place of what should be its real motive, the search for a good life. My own search for any life at all for Emily and me turned desperate. I sent out feelers far and wide. My old friend Walter Cummings came to my rescue. He was an associate dean at a university in Seattle, and he didn't like what was going on with the assault on the cannon and its good men. Absurdist, he said. Reductionist, I agreed. A blow to the pursuit of beauty and truth, he said. Tribalistic, I offered. He made a case for my hire at his university as one who retained the traditional ethics of rigorous pedagogy and noble self-examination. I imagine he pulled in some favors and lost some political capital. Emily and I arrived in Seattle. I took up my new position and we bought this perfect house with its breathtaking view. Emily started to grow a garden. She got a job at the Seattle Art Museum. We set about the task of finding friends. We threw parties. We invited the assistant and associate professors and the dean. We mixed them in with artists and with senior library staff or the director of the writing center, or if we were planning to throw caution to the winds, even faculty from computer science or physics. When I was awarded tenure the following year, the newly promoted Dean Walter Cummings threw a party for the three of us newly tenured, Betsy McDowell, David Meyer and me. My department chair threw another party at which I got drunk. It didn't matter, everyone laughed. I had earned tenure and with it, I had earned the right to be soused. <laughs> and you know, I, I yes, virtual clubs. I, I, it's a voice that I still cannot get out of my head in such a interesting way. And I think that that's what really dropped, like I just was turning my page, like, cannot put the book down I was like I need to know what's what's gonna happen and so what's the decision behind um you know narrating the book from Dr. Harding yeah so as I was saying you know the voice started to come to me during that time during uh, November December 2016 and um I was actually writing it in third person similar to what Shoshil was saying and it's sort of a combination of those two responses and how we get to voice and plot um I was sort of writing it from these three points of view of the three main characters in the book, which is Oliver Harding, professor of English, Ruhaba Khan, who's a law professor, Pakistani law professor, and uh, her nephew who comes from France, Adil Alam. And so um, as I was writing the other two points of view, I, I would go a few pages and I would see that I was I had actually written it from Oliver's point of view, like <laughs> a story from Oliver's point of view. And, and, and the writers here get it, like, you know, one voice demands to, you know, to tell the story. And so I kept erasing it, going back and saying, oh, I, I need to correct this, it's just silly me. And then the silly me went into 20,000 pages. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, it looks like this is the voice we're using. And it was, it was also really creepy that this was coming out of my head. And, you know, then I had to do a lot of self-examination saying, like, is this me? Am I somehow an, a white man? <laughs> <laughs> I embrace this institutional stuff too hard, right, uh, in the academy. And so 
I think that was once I decided that I was going to go with this, I realized why that was happening. And it was sort of this erasure. You know, I wanted the silencing of Rahaba's voice because that's what the story is going to be about. I wanted the silencing of the other and show the erasure and make the reader sort of uncomfortable that, wait, wait, why aren't we getting the other person's voices here? Why aren't we hearing oh. from them? And so, you know, then the story becomes about who gets to tell what story and um, how how do you feel and what, what kind of claustrophobia do you feel if you're only hearing it from his point of view? And so he is definitely an unreliable narrator. And um, I really, then I started to enjoy playing with that. And then I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm just going to tell the story from under your skin, Dr. El Oliver Hardin. So that's what I went with. It's so interesting that you said erasure. And then I know, Sochi, you said erasure earlier. I literally have in my notes, I was like, the through line that I saw, you know, as I'm thinking of your books collectively and how they might be in conversation with each other is erasure. You know, I, I, there's erasure. And, you know, Sochi, I would love for you to actually, that segues perfectly into your reading, which I think highlights a little bit of that that we're talking about. Yeah, um, thanks. The, the, the kind of lead up, actually, I sort of didn't realize this. I think it's kind of Raquel's turning point um, in her young the smidgen of her little life that we get to see in the book but um you know she has been working on this thesis with her faculty advisor john temple and she has been which is on um this artist jack martin and then she sort of stumbles on the story of anita de monte who was murdered by jack martin and um after a kind of traumatic incident where she breaks up with her boyfriend, that, that, that's the spoiler alert, but um, she goes to the only place that she can think to go where she can be herself and she goes to the school library. And so she's been working on her thesis and she had asked for a book about Anita de Monte when she discovered her and they had to kind of bring it in from another library. And so now this is, she's finally getting to look at it. Staring at the catalog anew at the other images that had been waiting on her carol, Raquel realized that part of why de Monte's work struck her as so dynamic and fresh was because she had genuinely never seen anything like it before, not in school, not in the museum. She had been, not been taught to appreciate it, not the way she had Mondrian and Kandinsky and Picasso. She realized that so much of what she thought was good art had simply been that which had been elevated by John Temple because it was understood by and spoke to and created by men just like John. And that in the omission of things that were made by or understood by or in conversation with people like her, Raquel had unconsciously begun to see those things as lesser. And that revelation sparked one that was even more painful. The reason that Raquel subconsciously believed that Nick knew better than her was that it was Nick's point of view that had been affirmed and internalized by the white walls of every museum or gallery that had ever been told was worth looking at. She stared at the colored plates, went through each image slowly page by page, taking them in, not so much to try to understand them, but to let them talk to her, to hear what it was Anita de Monte was saying, to see if there was any wisdom she could pass along. And whether it was staring at the pieces or just the emotion that came to fill the space of sitting in silence deep in the library, what began to churn up in her was anger, raw and salted anger, a blister desperate to burst. The root of the rage was nothing in particular and everything at once, Jack Martin, Nick Fitzsimmons, his mother, her shorn hair, this fucking school, the first world, the art, history, art world, the art history department, the art history girls, her bony legs, her still too fat stomach, Mavette not sticking up for her, her not sticking up for herself, her ridiculous knockoff Prada bag, the real Gucci one Nick replaced it with, her letting Nick replace it. But most of all, she felt a deep ire for Professor John Temple because he let his passions dictate her passions and she'd never questioned it because she had trusted him. And all this time he knew she had been searching, looking for any small reflection of herself in the art world. And all this time he knew about Anita de Monte and never said a fucking thing. More virtual claps because whew, that part, that part when he never said a thing. And when you, if you read the book, then you know that part is like, it's just a moment for that main character, for Raquel, for a realization that she needed to have. Um, and yeah, I mean, the the thing that I think about your books in terms of like, when we're talking about campus novel, you know, um, and I feel like it lends itself to so many, you know, people have an idea of what 
a traditional or there might be ideas of what a traditional campus novel is. So I'm just really curious, like, how did you find yourself either adhering to it, challenging it, subverting it, you know, in the typical idea of what a campus novel is, if that's something that yeah. you toyed with as you were writing and developing these books? And Rebecca, let, let's start with you. Yeah, I, um, for one thing, you know, as I said earlier, I think there was a bit of reacting to the narratives that are out there. You read something and you're like, that's not how it works. You know, the meme of like, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. I feel like that often when I'm <laughs> looking at something about boarding school novels, right? Or, or um, movies. But um, I went back and I was rereading um, some classic ones. Specifically, I went back and I read... Uh, I'd read this first in 10th grade, but a separate piece by John Knowles, which is like about someone, you know, post-World War II, it did not hold up. I'm <laughs> sorry to say. Um, I, I loved it at the time. Um, and it's the classic, like all boys, mm -hmm. you know, and the, um, and the very symbolic, like one of them might've, you know, accidentally shaken the other one out of a tree and he's, uh, he's, you know, devastatingly injured. Um, it just didn't hold up the writing, the, mm, um, so I was very sad because I felt like this was, I was going to go back to like mm -hmm. the source, like the mm -hmm. thing, kind of not, not great. Um, but uh, so as I said, you know, I think just in the sense of, you know, what's the setting, mm -hmm. I was going to embrace this fully. Um, and I have an outsider, um, which, basically, you know, any story about adolescence, you're going to have an outsider because every adolescent is an outsider or thinks they are. Um, so, but I had someone who really was new to this world and really looking at it and able to explain it to us because she's looking at it with fresh eyes. So I felt like I can really talk about all aspects of a school like this, um, but without the romanticization mm. and without the like, everyone's secretly in a cult and there are secret <laughs> tunnels under the campus, the stuff that uh, Harry Potter, right? Like that's right. what I'm thinking about yeah. your that in that terms, yeah. Yeah, but I wanted a a lens of realism, and also because my book goes into wrongful incarceration, it goes into the legal yeah. system, it goes into murder investigation. I also didn't want like the romanticized or Perry Mason version of those things. Um, I didn't want a case to be instantly solved and someone's just sprung free from prison because that's not the way it works, even when you find exculpatory evidence. Um, so I made this decision early on, just like full realism. I can set it in a place that is in and of itself kind of romantic and really fascinating, but we're going full realism, even when it would be you know, more satisfying to some readers in some ways to have that romanticized version. Oh. Um, and that's yeah. such a good point, because I think often when we think of the campus novel or even like boarding schools, they are very much ten like it's like the romanticization of going away and, mm -hmm. you know, being away from your parents and the liberty that comes with that. But again, there's things that are at your in your book, there's core, core things that are important in terms of society and how we show up in the world. Um, yeah. How about how about your book, Sonona? Um. Yeah, I mean, once I realized that it was a campus novel and uh, what my intention was, uh, was to subvert, right? Um, oh. um, I wanted to take the the typical narcissistic white male narrator of these campus novels, stay in his head, like let him tell the story, but also be telling the story a little slant, right? So that... Um, the the discerning reader knows that this is not just like we you know he's an unreliable nat narrator and he's been that way for you know all, for several years where these books have been written by white male authors um but what was going on underneath all of those things too right like so we are not just following the story of the bumbling english professor but we're also looking at well what, what about the other people around him uh what's happening with them you know who whose voice are we missing and who is on campus now and so i mean so then the student protests and things like that just excite me you know because i feel like they're the ones who are saying like hey the academia has changed you know let's just like it, it's your the ground has changed from under your feet and you're not even recognizing it and i think that's sort of my frustration <laughs> with academia me as well, uh, even though I stay ensconced in it. Um, but um, 
but also like how do we take that and also it, it the story is not for his benefit mm -hmm. it's he's telling someone else's story and the challenge for me was then if he's telling their story how do I not flatten them on the page how do I make them come to life without uh without giving voice to them so that became like the the exciting thing to do but definitely the idea was to sort of subvert his narrative um because also the reader readers have changed right like a lot of readers I mean you know people who've written to me and said this is a book you know this is not for the typical white gaze in a way right like even though you know of course people it's sort of been appreciated I'm, I'm thankful of that that it's been appreciated by different people who are in the mainstream as well but it's definitely telling a story of those whose voices have not been heard um, and how we are viewed. I think it's really important. I mean, for me, at least, it was very important to tell the story of how some people are seen in these white institutions, right? And these immutably, immutable institutions where people are refusing to change and refusing to give up power. And I, I mean, also, I was also trying to speak about America in general. I don't know if that came through, but I was yeah. trying to. The, the Absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. It comes through in all of your books, which I feel like is so, so like brilliant to me when a book can entertain and also like kind of be like ask, have you ask bigger questions about the world that you're in? Yeah, and I think one of the things too, I think that we are all getting at is like. Uh, that that certain people are supposed to be grateful for being let in, right? Yeah. That we, we we want you to be here. Come on, we're encouraging you. The sort of like the mentoring aspect of it, but it's the unsteady feeling that we keep getting that somehow you now see me as a threat if I come into my own, right? So, I mean, so to, to take all those themes and try and also write beautiful prose is what I was trying to do and, you know, also displace this guy and all of that, so... <laughs> How about you, Sachi? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's similar to what Sonata was saying. Um, I feel like a, what I was sort of trying to look at was power mm. in, and how also academia reinforces power outside of academia. Mm. And, you know, I think I have a set, like and when you first meet Raquel, she's like going in to talk to John Temple and she makes the observation that like he, whose name means nothing to anybody on the street has the power to move markets and institutions, right? Like, and and so she's kind of like in awe of this power. But, and and I think, um, and, and much of the story is about how these powerful people, I think we think about, you know, I've had a lot of experience with getting to be inside the room, you know, and it's like, and I think we think that like, everything's like, ah, ha, ha, we're gonna manipulate power. And often it's just like, that would be bad for our friend. We shouldn't let that story get out. Mm. Like, and it's like, it's not like a big mag, and that's gonna change the literary canon or like, you know, like, it's like, <laughs> like, it's like just like, like, I don't know, he's, he's a nice guy. He's a genius. He's a genius that's often like, yeah, is excused so many sins. And so I think it's sort of like how that then exalts the genius, academia reinforces the genius, which then create raises the stakes for protecting the genius. And so um, I really sort of wanted to kind of show in very intimate ways, like, you know, John Temple doesn't think he's like start helping to cover up a domestic abuser who murdered his wife he's like i just thought this guy was cool but then mm -hmm. that's his identity like so much of his identity comes from that and um and i think for raquel her coming of age i think of it the, of the book is like a dual coming of age book it's like one person's coming of age in death and the other's kind of coming of age in in her life and she's like her real coming of age is less about having her heart broken than it is about seeing how power works mm. how these things work and and who has has it and who doesn't and what that and and what that how that values something you know like it's like this i think isn't really a spoiler but like you know at the end his mother like her boyfriend's mother has been like hiding this woman's work right like as part of like you know just like as a favor to somebody and it's so of inval not of value to her that she just kind of gives it away you know like and meanwhile it has so much value to raquel like it's like so i think it's just um a lot about like i i really feel like it ended up being a book about power and power in relationships intimate relationships 
um, you know, mentor mentee relationships, institutions, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, it would be fair to say for me that all of your books played with power yeah. in one sense, in yeah. one way or another, you know, how, how would you all describe or how would you expand on that, um, Rebecca? Yeah. I mean, I, um, my book is, it's a very much a Me Too book, both literally in that there's a Me Too storyline on Twitter in my book. Um, and um, in the sense that we have someone looking back, um, I will say that, you know, one of, there were two things that surprised me about Me Too early on. One was simply that it happened and it stuck and it wasn't forgotten the next day, right? Um, but the other was that we were all looking back not only on the, on not, not just looking at Hollywood and not just looking at the big dramas in our own lives, but looking at the little things, the hallway mm -hmm. harassment, the uncomfortable workplace, the sketchy mm -hmm. teacher, right? Um, and I was doing that. Mm -hmm. In the time when I was sitting down to write this book, I was looking back on, you know, uh, on the one hand, kind of realizing things I hadn't seen at the time. And on the other hand, going, I, I was never okay with that. I pretended to laugh at that one thing that happened because everyone else was laughing. And I thought that was what you were supposed to do. Um, but I wasn't comfortable. And it turns out talking to other women who were there, they weren't comfortable either. And now we're finally all talking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the power for me, looking back and something I really tried to put in the book, it's not just about any one person. It's not just about a teacher. It's not just about a popular kid. It's about the systems in place. Mm. And girls would often reinforce that for other girls. Like, why just laugh it up? It's a joke. Right. Um, and, uh, you're, it's the system of power that you're in the system that tells who gets to make the jokes. Right. What kind of jokes do they get to make? Mm -hmm. Who has to laugh at them, even when they're not funny? Yeah. Um, and who gets to speak up and mm -hmm. who would be really cast out if they dared to speak up and ruin everyone's fun time? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a that's a systemic thing. Um, it's systemic in my book. You know, in the book, it's about gender. It's also about race because um, this guy who's wrongfully imprisoned that becomes very much about race as so much wrongful incarceration is in our country. Um, also about class, who has money okay. within the system, who doesn't. Um, and one of the things that was most important to me was that my character, Bodhi, who had seen herself as such an outsider, really needs to, by the end of the book, come to terms with the systems she has been part of, mm -hmm. wittingly or not. Mm -hmm. um, she felt like an outsider at the school, but she was part of the school. She feels like an outsider as a young woman. She was part of all these gender dynamics she feels like an outsider she's um you know in the world at that time she's part of institutions like whiteness mm. that she didn't opt into but that she's responsible for responsible for um helping fix some of the wrongs when she can um so it's important that it not just be oh this poor outsider character but that she needs to really face herself by the end of the book and see what she's been willingly or unwillingly complicit in mm -hmm. at the same time that she's been victim to so many of those same power dynamics. How about you, how about you, Sonana? Yeah. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I will. Um, sorry, my dog's barking. There's a thunderstorm oh. right in Seattle, which we don't, we don't usually get happen. It just happens to be happening right now. So if it's too loud, I'm sorry about that. No, I'm I can't hear it at all. I don't know okay. if that helps to know. You're Great. coming okay. in clear. Great. Um, so a friend of mine, after after he read the book, said, uh, oh, wow, so you, uh, the theme sort of is, and I hadn't thought of this, right, um, that if you're going to tell a story about power, you may mm. as well tell it from the point of view of the person who has it, mm. right? And so I didn't realize, you know, I hadn't articulated it for myself in that way, but I, I think that is what I was doing. Um, and... And I will change that to I believe that is how what I was doing, because I think, again, I think is a very gendered way of putting things right. I believe that is what I was doing. <laughs> uh, so and yes, you know, the, the Me Too movement, I mean, all of these things in my, you know, my academic research is on social protests and then the Me Too movement happens. And then we have, you know, um, uh, the murder of George Floyd and all these things were happening as I was writing multiple drafts and um just examining 
how power, especially in academia, is just such a so hidden in so many ways, you know. Um, yeah. But it's also so deeply entrenched that we don't know what we and you know I, I come from India and I sign up for this you know this sort of the life of the mind in American academia and I'm very quickly co-opted into that system right I'm very quickly tutored into the way power works and the way you you know the tenure track system how you behave don't laugh too loudly I mean the, the kind of messages we get right which is again echoing it was true in uh, in 2016 and it's happening now with what what how exactly do you want us to laugh like what is the exact pitch at which we should be laughing someone said oh Kamala giggles too much uh, Hillary was cackling too much. Like, what is the pitch at which we're supposed mm -hmm. to laugh? So, you know, the word, the uh, the book, uh, the title of the book, The Laughter comes from a little bit from that. And also, as Rebecca was saying, like, you know, who is, who gets to decide what's funny? So mm -hmm. Oliver Harding thinks he gets to weigh in on everything with his sense of humor. And he doesn't realize that we're laughing at him. And that's that's the part that I enjoy doing, that I'm going to write him as this guy who's making funny comments on everything. But we're laughing at him and saying, like, you're such a you're such a loser, like you're, you're gone, like you, you don't even realize how out of touch you are. Right. And at the same time, he still has the power and we are complicit in it, like, you know, toward the end without a spoiler, but toward the end when she goes, um, Ruhaba goes, she's had sort of a fight with him. And she goes to her department chair and, and the department chair, well, says, you know, you're on tenure track. You really should make nice with him. And she sends him, uh, sends her to make nice with him. Right. And these little things, these little things are the, the thousand paper cuts, right? The death by a thousand paper cuts, mm -hmm. which is just like you, you can't complain about something like that. You can't say my department chair sent me to make nice with this guy and said I should have coffee with him. But it's a thing, and every day it sort of cuts at you. And so, um, so you know, so so to show the cluelessness of power and the unwillingness, like the only thing, the only time he has to think about power is when he has to think about how he may lose it. Oh, mm. so I, I, that's and you see it played played out in uh, in politics, right? Like all these men, especially mm. the way they're scrambling, they're only concerned with how they may lose it. They're not really concerned about. How they don't have to think about power ever again after that. That's right. So, mm -hmm. can I just add one thing? No, I was just going to ask you. Could, are you? Yeah, please, well, please. Just, you know, like in talking about this, I realized that my book um, might be the only one that's set like in the far, like in the past, like where the character is living in the past. And to that point about like laughing at the jokes and blah blah blah, I, you know, in doing my research to try to write Raquel, because you have to like write it without the judgment, like of like, oh, I can't believe we did this, you know, like it's like like and we thought like this, right? Yeah, <laughs> and so I um, I I bought all of these women's magazines from like the mid '90s, like Cosmo and like Vogue and all, and New York Magazine and blah blah blah, and like and I texted my group of close girlfriends and I was like, we are lucky, we survived. <laughs> Like, like the quizzes were like, what eating disorder is right for you? Yeah. And it was like, like, like oh, yeah, believe me, it would suit you great. Like, it's like, like literally, like it was so, um, like I, I can't get over it. And like, and even just like, you know, I always make a playlist and my character is like, you know, very into hip hop. And that was one of the things that like, I, I purposely put in there, like, like literally, she's like li listening, like screaming in her ear, Eminem, like talking about murdering his wife. And um, then like sec like R. Kelly, the sexual predator is like the biggest thing in the in uh, on the air. And like and it was all of this stuff that like you are you are literally programmed yeah. from every direct like that was what I realized. Like you are programmed in every direction to go to your male mentor and do whatever they say. Mm. Like, right? Like it's like it was wild to like watch that happen. And I think even to Sonoda's point. Like you are so inoculated, like you're so like you so buy into it because you already were pre like like this is going to be the thing that saves me. So then you're like, I'm going to play every rule because I want this is the thing that is going to be amazing. And like and you buy into all of it. And it was just it's really um, it was really wild to like have to like know what you know now and then go back and put yourself through that 
thing and, yeah. and then see society with the distance that we have it as it was then was really um, like, we're all, I'm happy we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> and like, de like, you know, like able to be thinking creative people with this like kind of agency because it was mm. wild for me to see the way in which you were like, how did you escape this, mm. trap? you know, this mind trap? Yeah. And I, I mean, for many of us, I'm I'm still trying to escape, and uh, and, yeah, I, and I'm yeah. a you know I'm a '90s baby. I was born in the '80s, and I, you know, yeah. like it's not it's not it's not it's easy. Not, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. And I think that um, it was it was just sort of wild to like like actually realize how much of this stuff was like bigger than you. Yeah. yeah. Just like Rebecca said, systemic. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. The other thing, I'm looking back on the 90s so much for my book, we thought we were so liberated. Oh, so mm -hmm. liberated. We thought we had so much figured out. Yeah. And of course, by we, I mean, I don't know, white girls. I, it wasn't, you know, <laughs> not everyone literally. That, but like, it felt like society had decided, right? Yeah. Like yeah, mainstream, yeah. everyone had decided that like, this is about as good as it's going to get. Like, That's look at all the things. And oh my god Vogue was like amazing. you can wear a suit oh yeah <laughs> you got power, yeah. <laughs> but it yeah. makes you it makes you wonder about how you know we you said like aren't we glad we're here yeah. but but you know are we going to look back 10 15 years from yeah. now and say oh my god why was i taking that right I hope so, I because there's a lot that's going wrong right now yeah, that we need yeah, to look back yeah. on with. <laughs> yeah no i mean i think that now what's happened is like all, it's just also that media is so diffused mm -hmm. before it was like we were so like literally fed from like four or five different sources so there was like now there's so many I think and part of what might wanted me to write about her and have her be in the past was somewhat that I I think sometimes there's a I have a lot of younger you know women friends like and colleagues and acquaintances but I think that there is like a sense of like oh my god these old ladies are so frustrating like they don't see things the way that we see things and I was like I wanted to also let them see how new we forget how new all, mm. like feminism is like we forget how new some of these concepts are and like and that you know your mother is either like a rampant like if you were around our age your mother's either a militant feminist or she's like meet a nice man at that college like, <laughs> <laughs> and i think like that we don't realize that we're only a little bit away from that kind of thinking like right like about what our options are and like the buffet what's at the end of the buffet yeah, yeah. And it makes me think a lot about what the modern campus novel will look like or how it will evolve, mm -hmm. you know, the subgenre, genre, whatever you want to call it in itself. So um, interesting, yeah. I mean, and I think you all are feeding into the canon in such a positive way with your books, um, whether you intended to or, or not, you know. Um, but I know we are at eight o'clock and we were going to pivot to audience questions. Um, I Before we jump into them, I'm going to give time for people to you know, maybe you forgot that you could do that. Go to the Q&A box and type in your question. One last question. We can do like a speed, a round speed. Um, Rebecca, you mentioned one book that you would return to. And I'm just curious about book recommendations, books that you all loved for campus novel. Like what is maybe two books that you have read uh, that you would consider campus novels that you would um, recommend? And, and you there is no police here. I, whatever you consider a campus novel is a campus novel. Okay. <laughs> I I want to throw out there. Um, it, it's not terribly well known, but I, I absolutely love it. There's a book called The Virgins by Pamela Ahrens. Um, it's from Tin House Press, and it is a phenomenal. It's a boarding school novel. Um, just a phenomenal book about. Um, from a really strange point of view about an Andover like school in the seventies. It's so good. Um, that one, uh, I recommend that to everyone, like any independent bookstore day when I'm in there, like hand selling books, I'm like, here, take it. <laughs> um, and the others, you know, I'm looking, it's partly for me, like, it's not just, is it a good book, but like, is it accurate? And those don't always go together. Um, Prep by Curtis Sittenfeld actually, which was a huge bestseller. She gets it right. She knows what she's talking about and it's a good book. So that's another one that, okay. um, but mm. there's some, there's some books out there that are such good books that I just can't recommend because it's not how boarding schools work. And it, <laughs> it's, well, I will come to you if I want to romanticize <laughs> boarding schools because sometimes I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how about you, Sachi? Um, 
Weirdly, I didn't intend this, but I would say that they both actually take place at one's a fictionalized brown and then one is actually brown. I I did not reread um Jeffrey Eugenides book. Um, oh my God, now I'm blanking on the title. I didn't reread it because I loved it so much, but I didn't want it. It was a complete, I knew what that was. That was white brown and that was not where my character was living. Is that the marriage plot? The marriage plot. The okay. marriage plot okay. got brown right, white brown right. But like, I was like, that wasn't my brown. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't like, you know, <laughs> confuse them. And, but I, I loved it. And I thought what it did really well to that point about feminine, it really captures the infancy of feminism and like, um, like the the bind that women in that very fir- like kind of beginning of the second wave were like living. And, um, and then I loved it was so freaking weird. And like, I loved it. And that I, somebody steered me to when I was reading writing this book, and then I ended up loving it, it was Bunny by Mona Awad. Oh, I love Bunny so, so much. Oh my God, it's so awesome. Funny. It's so awesome. And like, and it takes place during an MFA, um, but like, it's still a campus novel. And it's just yeah. so good and weird. And like, that's kind of a book talky book that became a book talky book. But like, it's an awesome book. I I read it on like a flight, like one flight, like and it was I couldn't put it down. Yeah, it was amazing. He's unhinged in the best yeah. way. In the oh, best God. way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm reading next. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. good. It's so good. <laughs> Your reactions tell me everything I need to know. <laughs> um, how about you, Sonora? Um, On Beauty by Zadie Smith. Yes. Um, and it's yes. not necessarily okay. seen as a yeah, it's not seen necessarily as a campus novel, but it's a really really amazing uh, campus novel, and that was sort of at the back of my mind for years until I landed on this, and then um, I would say in some twisted ways, in in some aspects of it, uh, disgrace by James Co- how do, how does he yes. pronounce it? Co- I don't Co- know. I've been told it's what like Kudsaya, Co- but I'm probably that is a great <laughs> campus novel. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and, and definitely the Me Too aspects, and but also in terms of a really fully etched out um, ma- uh, main character, um, you know, problematic. I, I took some inspiration from that, mixed it in with the inspiration from Zadie Smith and sort of like went with that. But those two, I think, were definitely made a big impression for me. I love that. Um, okay, so our first audience question is, um, what are your writing habits slash rituals look like I don't and... have any oh okay and I, that and was I really love talking about it I have no ritual I have no routine sometimes I go for two months and don't write and then I sit down and I write all weekend and I don't I'm not a person whose brain works that way I have ADHD it's just not how I roll um and I think it's really cool when people have those and want to share them but I am always really vocal about not because I don't want anyone out there who wants to write to think that they have to have, first of all, a a day, like a life that allows for a daily writing routine, yeah. um, let alone a brain that works that way, where that would be the best way to write. Um, there are people out there saying like, you have to write every day. And I think that's such bullshit. Um, that's such the thing that like the man whose wife would put his lunch outside his door on a tray yes. would say, you know, yes. and um, I just, um, I have absolutely nothing. I'm total chaos. I'll write on the airplane or not. I'll write in this hotel room or not. I'll, uh, I wrote like all September and I wrote nothing in October and it gets done. I like that answer for someone who thinks that everything needs to be perfect in order to sit down and write. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I'm also into rituals. So, such <laughs> um, I, I don't have any rituals. I also don't have any rituals. I haven't looked at my next book since August. I hope my editor's not on here. <laughs> I, I will like, like, I try to then go in and be pretty obsessive about it. It's like, mm-hmm. like as much as I can, because I feel like, I don't know, the only thing I'll say is like, I feel like it's like, um, a little bit like method acting, like I get like really into the world. And so then I just don't want anything to bother me. So like, I, I, I will do and I do very long days when I'm in it, like, I'll like, I'll do very long days, like 12 hour days, 13 hour days, like, and just break to walk the dog and do some stuff. But like, I don't really want people to disturb me if I'm in the book. And so like, if I have a day where I know I have to engage with other people, like I I won't work on the book, I'll do other things. But like, it's like, so the only thing that I'll say is the habit is like, I just want to only do the book when I'm doing Mm. the book. And I don't want people to pull me out of it because 
you're in a world, right? Like, and so then you want to stay in the, in the world. Um, and I do do a lot. I do a decent amount of like research, like, well, I'm like, you know, kind of to get it. I, I don't like writing in the present to be completely honest. I think like, it's, I don't know what it is yet. It's like, it's, it's happening too fast. <laughs> I tend to go at least a little bit in the past. So like I do a little bit of research before I get started, but I don't have like a, somebody told me they're like, I write, light a three wick candle and I yeah. like, wow, like, okay. And I was like, no, I, I definitely don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, with me a few years ago, a friend, you know, I was complaining to a friend and I was like, oh my God, like work and then this and that. And uh, I wish I could live the writer's life. And she said, what if this is the writer's life? Oh. And that was really helpful. So, you know, when I'm getting all complainy, I think of like, oh yeah, I am living the writer's life. And so that means, you know, the one hour that I get to just even like jot down some notes or think about character or something. So it's sort of like snatched time from here and there. But ideally, and if, if you can make this happen, I think I like to stay with the story. So if I can take a few days off, and I've also like fought with everyone in my life. And so, apart from some friends and so I have a lot of good time like you know I don't have to if I don't need to do something on the weekend I can lock myself up and write um and so I'll take a few days like that and you know get away a little bit with uh, other writer friends but if I if, if I'm close to a deadline what I do is set up writing dates with friends with other writers and just sort of sit down in a coffee shop shut up don't don't talk about anything maybe like 10 minutes of talking and then just write for two or three hours and just like get into get back into it so that the story is in your head through the day because the writing is also when you're walking and picking up your dog's poop is you know like something stumbles you stumble upon something or or when you're st you know staring out the window during a meeting or something that's all writing so that's the writer's life mm -hmm. I love that as like a baby wannabe writer, the romanticization of writing is something that is really hard, to, of writing a book that is really hard to overcome. So thank you guys for your answers. Um, so this one says in future campus novels, like in the, in, we're talking about the literary campus novel canon, who else uh, do you want to read about? Either characters, types, populations. So what is missing? You all feel, uh, what voices? Um, there there are so many staff people on campuses and nobody, I've never read a campus novel from the admin, from the person that has to be the custodian of such oh. a department, from the person that manages the annoying students in the cafeteria that are student workers. Like, you know, like nobody, although usually they're pretty hardworking, the people that get, like take the cafeteria jobs, but like nobody's, I've never seen that perspective. And I think because like Raquel's mom works in a cafeteria at the Met, like the, the character's mom, that's her job. Like, it's like, like she sees the other side of the people that are in these little, the Michigas that we all talk about, like that are still being served, right? Like we've not gone to like, like there's a lot of campus novels about people on the outside of privilege, but they're still kind of poking at the perimeter. And I've never seen the anything where you have the, you know, like the campus not like you I've never seen you know that obviously it's brown like I've never seen the 60 year old admin from Nantucket trying to manage pronouns do you know what I mean like it's yeah. like, like, <laughs> like it's like, like from Pawtucket you know like and it's like 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 I, not in that conversation in their day-to-day -day life but then part of it for their work and like and I think that we've not seen that I yeah, okay. uh, just really quickly I um for for my book, it was important that we, because she returns as an adult, my character, yeah. the teacher, she's talking to other, to teachers who are there. That's a side of this world that I know really well because of, of where I live. And it um, it's interesting. I feel like for university novels, we often get the professor's point of view. But for anything about high school, whether it's a big public high school, a prep school, whatever, it's like this kid-centered universe. Like people remember when they were students and that's kind of all there is. Um, and there are very few, um, Skippy Dies by Paul Murray, which is a British novel would be one exception where we get the teacher's point of view too. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you, the like the faculty side, the admin side, the staff side, the um, that's, uh, that's like probably, choose your stories. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you want to add anything, Sonata? Yeah, I would just know exactly what Sochil said um, and Rebecca reiterated as well. I think that's the same, you know, the custodial staff, especially like they they go through the trash, right? They, they know what, what happened in this office during this day, right? Uh, but also they don't have to write about that. They, you know, they don't have to write about the perspective of the people in the offices. But I think that that would be... And we know that's coming. We know that that perspective is coming. That's what that's what uh, excites me. That's pretty exciting. Um, I'm excited. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Unfortunately, a time flew, uh, which I I love, but I also wish we could spend more time together. Um, so just to kind of end us out, and I think this is a great question. Um, the question is: When you're writing a campus novel as an insider to the world, meaning if you have some ties some way, Rebecca. You know, you with your um, history, where you live, Sochi working for, you know, different academic institutions, you're in Sonora. So how much do you worry about uh, slash, um, you know, yeah, you think or worry about people recognizing or trying to piece together, you know, pieces of your life to just your f fictional novels, which, uh, you know, is is a big loaded question to end on, but maybe a good one. <laughs> I can say, um, first of all, it's it's frustrating, I think, anything you write that um, it, and people have noticed, particularly for women and people yeah. of color, yeah. um, readers just assume autobiography mm. more than they would for some white man who's just must be an artistic genius. Um, and I think we've all, you know, probably had autobiography assumed of various things we've written. Um, so, and in this case, I was really skirting it. Like I knew I was, <laughs> it was really gonna be uh, an issue. The two things that I did, because I, I did not want to create trouble at my husband's school that my kid goes to also. Mm -hmm. um, so the two things I did, one was I made it as different in every possible way as I could, um, short of making it a religious school or something. I, I live near Chicago, I put it in New Hampshire. I made it a big ski school. We don't have skiing in Chicago. Um, just every little thing where anyone who went to the school where that I went to would know kind of right away, this isn't it. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I did, and I recommend this for all kinds of issues like this that come up is um, I started, I got it off my chest early by starting to draft my author's note as I was writing. Mm. And the author's note, which then is there in the back of the book basically says, anyone who knew me in high school knows this isn't me. And, and hopefully you also know it's not about you <laughs> and it's not about this school. And um, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I recommend that like anything you're worried about people misreading or like I had to fudge the facts historically, whatever that thing is, just start writing the author note because mm. you can get it out there and then you can leave it alone. Um, but those two things together hopefully worked, but it is definitely a risk you run. Um, and uh, in this case, I, you know, often you just kind of hope that people know that you made it up. In this case, I really had to address it head on. Uh, Sochi or Sonora, do either of you want to add? I think those are great points. Well, in, oh, so go ahead. Go, go ahead, Sonora, please, please, please. Oh, I was I was gonna say in my case, I it's a campus set in Seattle, <laughs> so the the risk of people uh, thinking that it's my uh, campus. I, so I I did change, you know. Let me tell you the truth, okay? One, I have tenure, and so that's a great thing to have. <laughs> Although these days, that's also you know it's sort of challenged, but um, you would be surprised at how many white men have read my novel and said, this guy, I mean, so problematic, right? And I want to say like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of based on you a little bit, but <laughs> I, I, want, I want people to recognize themselves and see themselves as the problematic guy, but no one does that. So that's, again, that shows how power works, but it's sort of been tongue in cheek, you know, and, and I haven't, I mean, um, I think, I think, yeah, there's, there's a reckoning people, everyone in academia needs to have, and I hope that they see themselves in it. But um, but I haven't had anyone say that, you know, ask me, is this me? And I haven't used exact descriptions or anything, although haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, what was it, Flaubert, about Madame Bovary? Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Like, you know, they're all me. Like, the murder is mm. me, Anita's me. Raquel is me. They're all me. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, they're not exactly me. They're me. And then there are other people like, you know, they're, they're all, I think about, I always tell people novels are to me are pain collages and you're mm -hmm. pulling 
this thing, this random memory that you have from something, a sensory memory, and you're like, that's this, that's the thing to find here. And then it does, it make sense. It's not in the same order. It's not the same people. It's like, you're, you're a hybrid of three different individuals. And like, you know, you're like, it's, it's not exactly you, but you're in there. And so, you know, I don't, I think it doesn't matter to me. Like, I think it's like, it's lazy, like no offense to readers. I love readers, but like, it's lazier to think that I'm exactly Raquel is me when I was in college than to think that I have more in common with Anita as a working artist, as yeah. a woman working artist, right? Like in my middle, you know, she's in her thirties. I'm in my forties. Like, like it's, it's like, because it's not as direct. Cause I didn't, I went to Brown and was first gen and like, you know, like, it's like, like, um, but, I think she's more distinct from me than maybe Anita is. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, so I think sometimes where readers see similarities is not always where, you know, you, the author see, see them, but I, you know, I, I do agree. Rebecca is so right. It's like, like, it's like everybody's trying to expose you as just having written memoir. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, gotcha. like <laughs> and if someone did this thing, if someone writes autofiction, like, yeah, that's, so that's cool right. And it's to be like, that's right. That's lauded, right. But yeah, it's people want the sort of the Romana Clef that they can pick apart, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah, yeah find out. <laughs> There's one character I, that I will say was not barely fictionalized. I just gave him a different name and I told him I was doing it because he just, to me, lived as such a funny character in my, my youth, which was my, my guy best friend in college who was a radio DJ and like, he's like Marcus the Mac and like, and he was literally, it was like lifted from my friend who was Dante the Don and like, and so I did, but I told him I was doing it and he's a very minor character and like, <laughs> everybody else you know it's like up here and melded with other things yeah yeah this has been such an honor thank you all if you are what you, you know thank you please make sure you grab these books if you haven't already if you haven't read them uh friends need them too so christmas is coming up so make sure you get copies too if you haven't and thank you to pen faulkner for these literary conversations they put on gwendolyn thank you so much for this this has been so much fun Oh, thank you so much, uh, Lupita, and also so Chiel and Sonora and Rebecca for that. That was a fascinating conversation. You, we are really lucky to have been let into that and to have you here with us. And I don't know about anyone else, but I'm now dying to read more of all of your work. Uh, so yes, get everybody's books. Um, for those of you in the audience who want to spend more time with Penn Faulkner, maybe you've caught the bug. Our next event is a deep dive into Witness by Jamel Brinkley on November 12th, one of our uh, last year's Penn Faulkner Award finalists. And it's honestly one of the most profound collections of stories I've personally read in a very, very long time. So November 12th, you got plenty of time to buy it and devour it, which you will do, I swear, and join us. Uh, and I hope to see you there and, and be part of that conversation with you. I I think we've just got a link um, dropped in the chat where you can sign up. And finally, I want to remind everyone here that Penn Faulkner is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to champion the breadth and power of fiction in America, like all the work we talked about here tonight. And we cannot complete that mission without help. Every single small contribution makes a genuine difference. Even 15 bucks helps us buy and donate a novel to one of the thousands of students we worked with in the DC school system through our education programs. And in many cases, you need to understand this, in many cases, that might be the first book that student owns. Can you imagine that? So. I think we've got another link dropped into the chat, and I hope you'll consider making a, a small contribution to help make sure that everyone, even those who can't afford it, have access to the kind of rich cultural experience that we've all just had. Uh, and with that, I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you again, our authors, and I wish you all a good night. <laughs>